Hi everybody. Let's finish up our discussion of chapter 1 by focusing on section 1.4 which discusses how to critically evaluate research in the news. What I'd like to do right now is just show you the eight different guidelines that are in your textbook and of course you can read them on your own. In class we're going to go through several examples. Let me make a couple quick points first. First of all, there are lots of very good examples in your textbook. So be sure to read over each of these guidelines and look at the examples so that you can really understand what they're all about. Secondly, uh, you'll see sometimes that when we're evaluating information that's presented in the press, whether it's online or in print, we won't have all the information that we need to actually critically evaluate each of these different guidelines. And that's because when a reporter reports on some type of research study, they, they provide a summary. And oftentimes those summaries just don't include a lot of detail. And when that's the case, uh, we can pull the original article. That's what I want to focus on right now. I'm going to give you an example that we'll discuss in class in which, in which we're going to kind of compare an article that was written about a research study, and then we'll look at the actual research study. So real quickly, here are the guidelines that are discussed in your textbook, which are really good. We want to do things like identify the goal of the study, the population that's considered, the type of study that was done, whether it was a true experiment or a correlational slash observational study. Of course, we'll want to consider the source of the study to determine how credible they are, to determine if they might have some ulterior motives. We'll want to examine the sampling method to decide whether it's a, an appropriate sampling method. And an appropriate sampling method will produce a representative sample. Well, oftentimes research is done with a sampling method that leaves much to be desired. We'll want to look for problems in defining or measuring the variables of interest. These problems can make it difficult to interpret the results. And that's because remember a lot of the things that we study in this world are not black and white. They're, they're relatively vague, things like bullying or intelligence. You know, there are many different ways that we can measure these types of things. So it's very important when we're evaluating a research study to understand how the researchers for that study were defining the variable of interest. We want to watch out for confounding variables because they can invalidate the conclusions of a study. You might recall that a confounding variable is a variable essentially introduced to, into a study that provides some type of confusion that often happens with correlational research also known of course as observational research the bottom line is observational research isn't as clean as a true experimental study and therefore there are often confounds that confuse the conclusions of the results of the study we'll talk about some of those examples Six, consider the setting and wording in surveys and polls, looking for anything that might tend to produce inaccurate or dishonest responses. Let me give you just a great example. There are victimization studies done in criminal justice research where people are asked if they've been the victim of various crimes. And, you know, people will probably be pretty honest about that. But you might be interested to know that there are also studies done in which people are asked if they have been perpetrators of crimes. So remember, people who commit crimes don't always get caught. So we can ask people if they've stolen things, if they've assaulted people, if they've murdered people. Is it likely that we're going to get accurate responses from them? Maybe not. That's kind of an extreme example. Seven, we want to check the results, see that they're fairly presented and represented in graphics. Um, you will see, and I'll give you a couple examples, where graphics can be very misleading. And there are a couple key things that we want to check. We just simply want to make sure that the graphics that are representing the results are presented in a way that is fair and not misleading. Because we don't want to be misled. And point eight stand back and consider the conclusions. Did the study achieve its goals? Do the conclusions make sense? Do the results have any practical significance? This is really a key point. Oftentimes we find statistically significant results in a research study. And that phrase, statistical significance, will have much more meaning to you as we go on and we learn about statistics over this semester. But one thing you're going to see is that statistically significant results don't always represent large effects or large differences between the groups we're comparing. 
In other words, they don't always represent practically significant results. There might not be practical importance to the results. So we'll discuss that to make sure you understand because we don't want to make much ado about nothing. Now, as I was mentioning, sometimes in a brief summary of a research article, we don't have enough information to make sense of these eight different guidelines. Uh, and in those cases, we might, if it's important to us, want to pull an original article. Let me give you a quick example of that, which we'll go over in class. Just recently, there was an article that came out in um, a scientific journal that got a lot of press, and it had to do with atheists having higher intelligence scores than religious people. And you can see that that's basically the, the title of this particular article that was published in Medical Daily. And I thought this was actually a decent article. It's very short. Uh, I have it on our website. I'm going to ask you to read it. And um, in this article, several of the guidelines that we just discussed can be addressed. You know, we can determine who the researchers were. We can determine what kind of study was actually done, things like this, but, but only in a very superficial way. And I always find it very interesting, too, because reporters sometimes just get things wrong. Uh, like just for example right here, it says in an analysis of 63 studies conducted since 1928, a researcher at the University of Rochester found a reliable negative relation between intelligence and religiosity. Well, that's kind of the take home message of the study. I just find it kind of interesting that they talk about a researcher from the University of Rochester because I looked up the actual study and to their credit, the people at Medical Daily here provided a link to the study. If you click on that link, you'll be taken to Sage Journals. This particular study was published in Personality and Social Psychology Review, which is a very good journal. And at that point, you can click and perhaps open up the actual study. Now, you would need to be, in this case, a member um, with a subscription to the journal. Now, Ohio University does have a subscription to this journal. So from any computer on campus, if you were to click on this full text link, you would get actually a PDF file of the study. Now, you might recall in this article that talked about the study, they talked about a researcher at the University of Rochester. It just seems like a, a pretty simple detail who conducted the study. Well, this, this study, as you can see, was conducted by three researchers. Two of them, I believe, were actually from the University of Rochester and one of them from Northeastern University. Um, which is in Boston. But this is my point. My point is that if there's going to be a summary of a research study, we now need to rely on this particular journal and this particular writer. Sorry for me jumping around. This particular writer right over here. And we have to make sure that person gets it right. They don't always get it right, even with silly little details. That's why we need to make sure that we have the confidence that we can look at the original article and then find out the information that we want. So, we will spend a little bit of time in class going over those eight guidelines. What I want you to do is read this article that was published in Medical Daily. You'll see there's a link right on Blackboard, right by the link that you clicked on for this video. And you will also see there is a link for the actual article. And you don't even really need to print this out, but I'd like you to just kind of look it over real quickly. No need to read it. It's like 30 pages long or so. Um, but you'll start to get a sense of how much detail there is in this article compared to how little detail there is in this article published in Medical Daily, which is just a summary of the research article. So my point for talking to you right now really is just to help you understand that when you read research in the news, you're reading a summary of research in the news. The actual research is out there and it has much more detail, much more information. I want to make sure over the course of this semester that you're equipped with enough information and enough skills that you can start to make sense of things. So for example, when it says that the relationship between intelligence and the strength of religious beliefs ranged from negative 0.0 to negative 0.25 with a mean Pearson correlation coefficient of negative 0.24, I want to make sure you have a sense of what that means and you will by the end of this semester. So back to where we were. For now, 
I've introduced to you the basic eight guidelines. I told you there are great examples in your textbook. Please review them. I've asked you to look at that Medical Daily article because we'll discuss it in class. That's pretty much it from section 1.4. So we'll talk about it much more when I see you in person. For now, that is all.